Good morning, church family. Happy Sabbath. Special welcome to all our visitors and guests and those who are, of course, regulars and those who are joining us via live stream and live audio. I'm so glad that you are all here. Uh, what a blessing. What a Sabbath. Um, I'm excited for a lot of reasons. I'm excited because I already have a verbal agreement with this worship team to come back and uh, bless us again. So I uh, look forward to that. I'm also excited to, because there are men in the audience today. Uh, a lot of you know last week I was, that's good, that's good every week. Uh, last week I was preaching at the Florida Conference Women's Ministry Retreat. Uh, 450 women and me. <laughs> so uh, it's always a little precarious. And then the Spirit spoke to my heart and reminded me that as uh, a husband of one wife and having three daughters, every day of my life is a woman's retreat. So I am perfectly capable of, of handling it. But it was a blessing. Thank you for your prayers. Just a couple. Uh, Gene is the current pastor for Emerald City SDA Church. He is the Washington Conference Regional Affairs Director and a colleague of mine and a friend and someone whose ministry I appreciate. He has held numerous leadership positions in nonprofit organizations dedicated to helping people create a better life for themselves. People who have experienced seasons of difficulty and particularly people who are transitioning out of incarceration he has ministered to. He holds a certification of moral recognition therapy, a Master of Arts in Pastoral Ministry from Andrews University, a Bachelor of Arts in Theology with a minor in History from Oakwood College, and an Associates of Arts in Political Science from Los Angeles Southwest College in LA, California. He has been married for 38 years to his wife, Jeanette. Where is Jeanette? Is she here? Hi. Welcome. Glad you're here today. They have two adult sons, Eugene and Alexander. And finally, I have to say on a personal note, as I was looking through uh, all of the things that he has done and reflecting on his ministry, he has done so much. And really, you can sum it all up by saying that Pastor Lewis loves Jesus Christ and he loves people. And we are so blessed to have him here today. Thank you for blessing us first service. We are looking so forward to what you have to share with us in the second service. God bless you. Let me hear you say amen. God is, he's good, isn't he? But like, and I've, they're used to me saying this because they, they usually are where I am. But it's like one old sister in, in her home church, her, her pastor was always getting up speaking about just how good God is. But she had been in the church for some time and finally she couldn't take it anymore. And she said, Pastor, May I have a word? And the pastor says, yes. And she said, chicken is good, but God is great. <laughs> we serve a great God, can I get a witness? I want to thank Pastor Pierce, the elders board here, and uh, all of the administrating staff for allowing the, I guess it's the Nelson family to uh, have a, um, just take us back a little bit into why we, we have black history. Um, a day or a week in some, some parts of the country they have it for the whole month. And so I, uh, I thought about, well, what would be the best way of sharing with the Puyallup church family in a way in which we all can appreciate what God has done for all of us. Yeah. And so I want to just turn your attention to Revelation, the seventh chapter, yeah. and verse nine in particular, because at the end of it all, I believe this is where we want to be. Yeah. John saw this. He said, after this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number of all nation, kindreds, and people, and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, 
clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sit up upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their face, and they worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. And I'll add one more ever so it'll be in the superlative sense. Amen. Our Father and God, I thank you for the privilege which is mine for the next few moments. You are more than good. You are great. You are amazing. So now, Father, let nothing stand between you and I. You are the sinless one. I am the sinner. Bridge the gap that stands between us. Oh, Lord, give us a heavenly setting, we pray this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. I have entitled this sermon I had this morning. I'm going to do it in a different way. I would do it at Emerald City. Uh, but I just want to do it the way the Lord gives it to me at this moment. Uh, I have entitled the sermon, Just Be Nice. <laughs> just Be Nice. Maya Angelou, a great African-American poet, wrote some years ago, we should all know that diversity makes for a rich tapestry. And we must understand that all threads of the tapestry are equal in value, no matter what color. That's what John saw. He saw people standing equal in value, no matter what their color. They stand like threads in a rich tapestry of faith. They come from all nations, colors. They are like a flag of many colors, waving in the air. As the Holy Spirit brushes gently against the face of Jesus, who finally gets his wish. As the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are one indeed, so is each person standing before the throne. Who are these people? Well, they come out of great tribulation. They know what it's like to have suffered for the sake of righteousness and for the cause of God. They are overcomers. Yes, they know what it means to, uh, to, str to struggle, to get through life, to make ends meet and to put God first and foremost in all that they know. But when I look at each of these that John has spoken of, in my mind's eye, in short, they can be summed up by saying, they are just nice people. <laughs> there are people like June Risden, June Risden was my fourth grade teacher. I went to an all black elementary school. As I was reflecting here, driving here this morning, I can't remember one white student who attended that school. But June Risden was different. She reminds me about Natalie. She was about Natalie's physique. The only difference was that she had red hair, and uh, she was real spunky, and one day she pulled me aside and, and uh, she said, listen, I'm not going to let you fail. And so every day after school, she would spend time with me, molding and shaping me the way she thought I should be academically. Not only that, every weekend she would come into our neighborhood, which could have been very dangerous for her. Pick me up, and she would drive me from where I lived out into her country estate. Her parents owned, Lord knows how many acres of land in Nebraska. 
And we would drive out to her parents' home in the country, a couple hours drive. And I can still remember as a child, uh, as she would drive down this gravel road, rocks flying everywhere. And I'm trying to figure out what am I doing here with her, but uh, <laughs> when we get there and uh, on the farm, there were horses and there were cows. Uh, there were all kinds of things this city boy would never thought to imagine even existed. On the farm itself, there was a pond full of fish. So whenever they wanted fresh fish, they could actually go into the pond and fish and we would have fresh fish. Uh, she taught me how to ride horses, how to live on a farm and one, one day, um, she said, we're gonna have fresh steak tonight. And she went out and, uh, with her family and uh, there she, her family, they, they slaughtered a, um, a big cow. <laughs> and I'm looking, wondering what in the world we're gonna do with all of that. But later that day, that evening, she, um, we had fresh steak with corn and all of the stuff that uh, I had never seen before. When I look at those people standing on the sea of glass, I think of people like June Risden. She shaped my worldview uh, very early in life as to what a person can become when one person is just nice to another human being. Reminds me of my mother as well. I had a younger brother who was always in trouble. And by the time he was in third grade, uh, he could no longer go to any school in the district. But mom was a smart cookie. <laughs> And she went to the school board, I mean the school district, and she told them, look, he's too young not to be in school. He has to be in school in somebody's school. And they gave her a hard time. She said, well, I'll make a deal with you. She says, now, well, actually, they said, we're going to put him into this school way out in the white neighborhood. And my mother said, you know that's not going to work. And the school district said, no, he's, that's where we're going to put him. So she came to me later that day and she said, listen, I'm going to make a, a deal with the school district. I'm going to allow them to send him out to that school, but I'm going to make a deal and say that he also has to take you. <laughs> <laughs> And I said, Mama, I don't really want to go out there. And she says, no, listen, he's not going to last two days out there. <laughs> she says, but you can make it. And I want you to make it because if you don't make it, they're going to think all black people are ignorant. And so I want you to not just be there, I want you to excel. And I felt like, I said, well, deep down inside, I said, I, why do I got to save the whole black race? <laughs> I thought that was a job for Jesus. <laughs> she says, but listen, our schools aren't any good in our neighborhood. It's a good school. And you can make it. She was right, we were out there, he and I, after the second day, he was expelled. <laughs> and there I was, all by myself. Mother told me, she says, now when you go, they're gonna make fun of you, but you must never fight with your fists. You must always fight with your mind. She said, now they're going to make fun of you, so don't, don't bow down to that. You just keep on doing what you're supposed to do. Well, 
she was a prophetess because they did exactly what they, the kids did exactly what she said they would do. And one day they started to talk about my family and I didn't fight. I, I just put my hands behind my back and I grinned and I buried it. But when they started talking about her one day, I couldn't take it. And I started to fight, and I wasn't a fighter. And I too was expelled. But I was happy because I had won the fight. <laughs> and as I walked home that day into the kitchen where she spent most of her time, and she said, what are you doing home so early from school? And I, and I had this big smile on my face and I thought she would be happy because I had won the fight after I told her and she said, um, listen, and she was small of stature, about five foot. And I must have been maybe four, four at that time, four or five. And she picked me up and she sat me on this little counter where the, that overlooked the backyard where she used to store her canned goods. And she sat me down there and she says, listen, didn't I tell you that was going to happen? And she said, um, I know you did it because you love me. But she said, let me tell you something. She said, one day they took my savior and they nailed him on a cross. They spit on him, they put a, corn, a thorn, a crown on his head. They took a spear and they stabbed him in his side. And she said, listen, the servant is not greater than the master. If they did it to him, then why not you? And she said, now listen, I don't know what you're gonna tell those folk. <laughs> but you better get back in school. <laughs> and I want you to turn around and go back. It was a long journey. <laughs> and I don't remember what I told them, but they let me back in school and I finished and I did well. Shortly thereafter, a Bible worker comes to our home and she was telling my mother, listen, don't you know that the seventh day Sabbath is on Saturday and not Sunday? Well, my mother only made it to the third grade, my father to the sixth. So she called me in and she says, Jean, have you heard anything about the Sabbath being on Saturday? I said, no, I haven't heard anything like that. She said, well, you should have known because you go to that rich school out there, you should know things like this. <laughs> so she said, take these Bible lessons and I want you to study them and tell me, find out for sure, if the Sabbath is indeed in the Bible, and that's the day we're supposed to go to church on. Well, even back then, Miss Risen had taught me never to take the opinion of one author or one person. And so I uh, took those lessons and I said, well, I need another set of lessons so I can compare them. And lo and behold, in every black home in those days, there was a, there was a picture of John F. Kennedy, Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King, and then there was a picture generally of Jesus standing with a globe in his hands. <laughs> And there was a phone number below there, so I called the phone number up on the way that had Jesus on it and ordered some Bible studies. Not knowing there were Voice of Prophecy and HMS Richards. <laughs> I discovered that late, years later. And I compared the lessons and one day, about three months later, she came to me, Bible worker was there, and she says, Jean, um, is the seventh day the Sabbath, and is it in the Word of God? I said, as best I can tell. 
She asked me a second time, is the Sabbath the seventh day? And is it in the word of God? I said, I'm, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> she asked me a third time. <laughs> she says, is the Sabbath the seventh day? And is it in the word of God? And I said, yes, mother, it is. She said, good. Go tell Reverend Thomas to take us off the church roll. We're going to join the Adventist church. <laughs> we believe in following what the word of God says. Not what any man says. He got eight of us that day. <laughs> she did. Uh, I'm from a family of 14. And he got eight of us joined the Adventist church uh, on that day. Mom was just a nice person. Helped shape me who I am spiritually. All of the, some of the prostitutes, drug addicts and people, she would always invite into our home, even to my displeasure. Because I would often remind her, Mama, there's, there's 11 of us in this house, with you and Daddy, that's 13. We don't need to add extra mouths to feed. There's not enough to go around. <laughs> And she would remind me that uh, you don't know where these people come from or whether or not they have moms and dads. Don't worry about the food God will provide. Amen. Years later, it was those same prostitutes and drug addicts who took care of her when all of us went away. I think about her, June Risden, when I think about those standing on the sea of glass, they're just nice people. Reminds me of when I went to Boone, Iowa, and the name bespeaks really of the place from which I was. It was in the boondocks. <laughs> Greg and I, a friend who I grew up with, we were the only two persons of color in the whole town, as well as the school. But when I think about the people there, and my experience there, I will always remember just how good they were to Greg and I. They were just nice people. And I believe that they'll be among those who John saw standing on the sea of glass because somehow they had come to the understanding that all threads of the tapestry are equal in value, Amen. no matter what their color. It reminds me of my first sergeant in the, uh, in the Air Force and a colonel. They were looking for African Americans to do a special job. <laughs> And I qualified, and I could never tell my wife what I did. <laughs> that was part of the qualifications. And so I decided I don't know if I really wanted to do that, as exciting as the job was. So they allowed me to play basketball for six months out of the year. And six months out of the year, I would do this special thing for them. I can remember once we were, I'd gotten into some trouble. I was hanging with the wrong crowd. You see, um, I had made E5 in less than three years. And they had me on a path to, um, to be an E9 in 14 years. And so they didn't want me um, with certain people. And so one day I was and I got into, um, I got into a problem and this guy was, because I was with some elite people, people used to tease me like they did in grade school. And one day I got mad and I didn't fight with my mind, I fought with my fists. 
And I hit this guy at work, knocked him out right at work. And I had just put on another stripe. <laughs> and I reasoned to myself, I said, well, it was just before lunch. I said, I think I'll go eat lunch now. Because if I go to jail, at least I won't be hungry. <laughs> and I won't have to worry about bread and water. I should have enough to sustain me until I could get out. So I went home and I, I called one of my mentors. He was one of the E9s in the elite. I told him what I did. And he said, don't you move, you stay home. We're gonna fix this. And then he called me and told me, go see Sergeant Edwards. Sergeant Edwards was a racist by his own words. Every black person who had ever gone into his office were kicked out of the service. And so here I come, and I said to myself, I've got to get the jump on this guy. I walked into his office, and I said, Sergeant Edwards, let me tell you something right now. Every black person who's ever come into your office, you have expelled them from the Air Force, and that's wrong. And little did I know he started crying right before me. And he said, I know I'm a racist. And I said, no, you're not, because today you're gonna to begin with me. <laughs> you're gonna be something different. You're not going to expel me. You're not gonna do anything. He said, well, I gotta do something. I said, well, I'll tell you what you do. You give me an Article 15, and I'll pay a fine. And I took out a wad of money to pay the fine. I said, no, you can't do it quite that way. <laughs> but he gave me the Article 15, and he says, what are you gonna, he says, now you can tear it up, because I gave it to you. <laughs> he gave it to me, and I tore it up, and nobody knew the difference. <laughs> And they sent me on to Saudi Arabia. President Reagan had just sold the, uh, the AWACS deal to the Saudis. And they wanted me to go over to, um, to do part of the deal. And so I went and um, I was there for about three months with a bunch of other experts. And finally it was time to go home. But on the way there, the colonel, who was over everything. He says, Jane, you can't go home. I said, what do you mean I can't go home? I'm ready to go home. I want to get out this place. <laughs> and he says, we got to find somebody to replace you. We got to, and that's going to take, it's going to take a while. And so I watched all of my peers from all over the world get on a plane, go home, while I was left there at a secret base in the desert <laughs> with the colonel and myself. <laughs> and I said, Colonel, I'm, I'm wanting out of here. He says, Gene, I can make you stay, but I would like for you to do it out of your own recognizance. <laughs> and so I stayed. And I finished the job that gave me to do. And the colonel came one day and he says, listen, you did an excellent job and um, you can go any place in the world you want and we'll pay for it. But at this time, I had missed my family so bad. All I wanted to do was go home. <laughs> and I said, well, I'll tell you what though. This is what I want you to do for me. I want you to put me on that EWAX, on that AWACS plane, and I want to fly home on that. I want to see what the president sees. If there was a war, I want to see it the way he sees it. He says, well, I can't do that. I don't have that kind of authority. I said, well, you ask me what I want, want, that's what I want. He said, well, let me make a call to Washington, D.C., and I'll get back with you on tomorrow. He came back the next day, and he said, I don't know what happened, but you're clear to get on. <laughs> And I rode on that plane from Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, to London, England, and I saw everything that you can possibly, you couldn't possibly imagine. 
you could see a person having a picnic for 35,000 feet in the air. It was a world uh, that was just unbelievable. And to see a little old black boy from Nebraska among all these big wigs and seeing what I saw, it was quite something. But I say to say this, the Colonel, even Sergeant Edwards, they were just nice people <laughs> who cared enough to care. Notwithstanding Jim Chase in Spokane, Washington, I met Jim, I was, um, Jim was running for mayor of Spokane, Washington. Now, Spokane at that time was 99 and and probably 99% white. And Jim was running for mayor. And so I called Jim up and I said, Jim, you don't stand a chance in Hades of winning. <laughs> but if you got enough guts to run, I ought to have enough guts to do, to help you. So I'm gonna make you a deal you can't refuse. And he said, what is that? I said, I'm gonna help you for free. And he accepted the offer. Lo and behold, the person that he was running against was filthy rich. He owned some of the banks. And so some of the city fathers thought that we really don't want him to be mayor because if he's mayor and he has, and he's as rich as he is and he also has all the power of an office, he's gonna run this town. And so they shifted all of their support <laughs> to Jim. <laughs> and Jim went on to, to win. Amen. And so he asked me, he said, what job do you want for helping me? And I said, well, I want your job, but not right now. <laughs> I want to be governor of the state one day. And he says, well, where do you want to serve? I said, put me where all the rich people are and I'll, and I'll find my way from there. Put me on a committee where all the money is and I'll find my way from there. Lo and behold, he put me on a committee, it was all women. <laughs> and I discovered, lady, they were all the wives of all the rich people <laughs> in the town, but they were just nice people. They treated me so well. And they offered to pay for my um, political aspirations at the time. But you know, God had something else in mind. And I just felt this urge to, um, to go into ministry. And that's what mama wanted anyhow, but I just never wanted to do it. She'd always prayed that I'd do that, but I just didn't want to do it. However, um, I went to Jim one day, and I said, Jim, I got this monkey on my back. You know the route that I want to take, but I feel like I need to go into ministry and he took me aside, he and his lovely wife, and they said, Gene, listen, if the Lord has called you to ministry, you will never be at peace with yourself if you do something else. Amen. Amen. You'll do well either way, but you won't be at peace if God has called you. And so, uh, that's where I met Jerry and Sue Potster. <laughs> and they took me under their wings. And um, molded and shaped me. It was a grand experience. That two people could be so nice. When mom came up after building my, um, my first church over in Spokane, we did it from ground up. And uh, mom flew up 
Well, I had, to co I had to coerce her because she didn't want to get on the plane. She wanted to catch the bus. I said, well, you're not catching a Greyhound bus from Nebraska to Spokane. Well, that's not going to happen. <laughs> She said, well, I can stop by and I can get some chicken. I can, look, we're not doing any of that. <laughs> so my sister, who is an anesthesiologist, um, um, I said, sis, put her to sleep. Give her something. <laughs> Find a way to get her to the airport and stay with her. And uh, just before she gets on the plane, give her something to put her to sleep. <laughs> she won't remember a thing. <laughs> Uh, and that's what happened. And when she got to Spokane, she said, boy, that was a nice ride. <laughs> and she didn't remember a thing. <laughs> but she made it to the church the day we opened it. My goal was to open the church debt free. It was over a million dollars at that time. And I was... Um, I was rubbing elbows, I was doing everything that I was taught politically how to raise money and get it. And we were $60,000 short of opening that church that day, get debt free. And uh, mom was there. Only one time in my life I've ever heard her speak in church, just once. And uh, she stood up that day in church and it was full. And she said, I thank God that he has allowed me to be here this day. And she used a word that, um, that was beyond her normal vernacular. She says, he has built this wonderful edifice <laughs> to the glory of God. And I'm sitting there, where did she pick that up? But, uh, <laughs> and then she sat back down and, um, and then Jerry and Sue threw a party for her. Uh, at their home and they made her feel like she was the only person on the face of this earth Amen. and on the drive home from church to home that's all she talked about and that was the last time my wife and I saw her alive I believe that we should all know that diversity makes for a rich tapestry. Amen. And we must understand that all threads of the tapestry are equal in value, no matter what the color. It was the same for Charles Dudley and Elder Dudley. Charles Dudley would, uh, was president of all the regional conferences within the North American Division. He was president of South Central Adventist Conference for 33 years. He was a big boy back then. Everybody looked up to him, and Elder Ward was senior pastor of the Oakwood College Church then, and he had been the senior pastor there for 23 plus years at that time. They ran the African American work back then. They were had all the influence, what they said went. One day I was walking down the road to the class and they pulled up beside me like two gangsters in a car. <laughs> and they told me to get in. <laughs> well, I still remember some street savviness. You don't just get in the car with anybody until you get in it. <laughs> But I said, no, it's okay, get in. And I got in and they drove me down to the Oakwood uh, College Church. And he says, listen, we've been watching you for, for months. And we like the way you carry yourself. Today we're gonna make you the associate pastor of the Oakwood College Church, how about that? And he says, Elder Ward is gonna be your mentor. He's going to mentor you. Where are your children at? And I says, well, they're public schools. So take them out of public school and put them in Christian, our academy. And we're going to foot the bill for that. And we're also going to pay you a salary all while you're in school for the two years you're here. 
and you're going to learn everything that we teach you. They were nice men. They were rich, they were powerful, but they loved the Lord. I never saw a person come into the office in need, genuine need, that didn't go out with what they needed. They helped to shape my worldview, spiritually and otherwise, on how to care for people. They were nice people. And when I think of what John saw on that sea of glass, I can't help but think about seeing them there one day. Success and money did not come in between them and the God that they love. Elder Ward, whom I know was a millionaire many times over, drove a Dodge Aries. I know because I had to drive him around. <laughs> and uh, and if any of you ever really ridden in one, I mean, they're not very comfortable. <laughs> And so one day I asked him, why do you drive this thing when I know you can afford a much better car? And he said to me, he said, Gene, uh, well, back, back then they called me Prophet. He says, Prophet, if I were to drive a much better car, every theology major on this campus would think that's what ministry is about. And it's better that I go drive something less than to create a bad image in their minds about what true ministry is all about. Yeah. And so I said, well, I guess we'll continue driving the Star Cherries. <laughs> <laughs> they loved the Lord. And I share these stories. And last but not least, my wife, whom I've known since third grade. Uh, they have shaped, helped to shape me. She thinks that uh, I can do anything. <laughs> and I just, I guess, simple-minded enough to believe it. <laughs> and things happen to get done. But they're nice people. Specificity is that term we use theologically when, when we just minister to one people group exclusively. In other words, we just minister to other people who look just like us. Specificity as its goal is racist. It's evil, it's anti-Ellen White, and it's biblically impotent. However, if we're reaching out to one people and we allow the Holy Spirit to lead and to guide us, then specificity can be an open door to racial, and ethnic reconciliation. Because at the heart of all of this, what we do for God down here should cause us not to lose sight of the fact that God has called us to live as though his kingdom is already here. And the people that I have mentioned they lived as if the kingdom was already here. Every time I go back home to Omaha, Nebraska, I try and find out what happened to June Riston. What she did for me will always be etched in my mind. She loved me for me. Not because of who I was, I was a nobody. 
but she laid the foundation for me to be somebody. All because she had a kingdom spirit. She saw every thread equal in value. Never looked at my color. And that's how the first century church got started. God, Jesus told them to go to Jerusalem and minister to your own. After which, everything opened up and there was racial and ethnic reconciliation to the point that the church grew and grew and grew and grew. That's what John saw. And what John saw is where I want to be one day. I want to see all of those people and more that help to shape me, guide me, do for me what I could never do for myself alone. So just be nice. Be nice to people. People will know that we are Christian by the, our love by the way we treat one another. Regardless of status, regardless of one's pedigree. Because one day, when we stand before the living God, we will all be equal in value. No matter what our color, station in life, where we come from, I love the Lord. And when I look at where he's brought me from, I have experienced everything I've ever wanted in life and I'm still young. And I thank God for people while on my journey were nice to me. Nice to me. And so now I get to spend the rest of my life returning the favor. Not just because I'm a minister, because that's all I really know. <laughs> Everybody who's ever meant anything to me were nice people. Even Bob Paulson. <laughs> he would been nice to me. <laughs> people of Piala, God is, is good. Be nice to each other. Be nice to your visitors. <clears throat> Certainly be nice to your pastor and his wife. <laughs> Just be and experience a little bit of heaven down here. My God. My father, the best friend I've ever known, I thank you for the privilege of allowing me to share just how nice you have been to me, to the countless men and women who I've experienced along my journey. I want you to know how grateful I am. And while I did not preach the way I normally would at church, I thank you for this time of sharing. And I pray that something that you have allowed me to experience along the way will help somebody here 
this morning. To the glory of God, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.